Thank you so much. Um, what lovely words. Um, so we are here to talk about qualitative content research, which is um, something that, that is near and dear to me and something that was probably like a bit of a late discovery for me, probably later than it should have been. Um, but I decided at the last minute that this title was just way too many big words. So what we're really talking about here is use your brain and stand out. That, those are the two goals of qualitative content research and the two things that are really trying to take us beyond where that research is right now. So we're gonna cover four things. The first thing I wanna make sure that we understand is really why it is that the quantitative data that so many of us, myself included, have relied on for years and years and years is just straight up not working for giving us really good content research and helping really inform a good content strategy. And then we're gonna look at three ways to get this qualitative research right. The first one is kind of the most traditional route, which is taking some of the quantitative data that we have and really improving it and then using uh, sort of a qualitative layer on top of that. The second one is using comments to get to the why. That's the beauty of qualitative data is where quantitative only ever really gives us the what, qualitative data gives us the why. And the last thing we're gonna do is a little bit of heuristic SERP analysis. Um, heuristic meaning just a, a sort of fancy word for kind of subjective expert opinion and SERP being search engines results page. So let's get started. What's not working and why? One of the biggest things to understand up front is that all the tools that we rely on, your Ahrefs, your BuzzSumo, your Moz, whatever it is, they are solving for tools they are not solving for you. And that's a really big thing to kind of wrap your head around initially. And a couple examples of that are first, they're trying to answer these two questions. First, what data can they gather at scale? They need this huge database to attract a lot of people. And that's usually gonna mean likes, that's usually gonna mean shares. It doesn't necessarily mean that these are the absolute best, most important things that we could possibly look at to get answers for us. What it means is these are the things that they know they can go and get at scale. And we also know that there are platforms that they're completely missing. Like LinkedIn is hard to scrape. Nobody has LinkedIn data. Anybody working in B2B would absolutely love to know what kind of stuff is crushing it on LinkedIn, but none of these tools that so many of us rely on have that data. So right off the top of the bat, we know they're missing that really critical information. And the second thing is what they're looking for is they're looking for this data that's really easy for users to understand. All these tools are growing by attracting really entry level people. So when it comes to taking the data points they have, they're not manipulating them in interesting ways. They're not creating their own internal algorithms to kind of elevate different interesting types of content. They're just giving you this kind of pile of data. And this is, you know, this is comical to me that, you know, like for BuzzSumo, the total engagement score is literally Facebook plus Twitter plus Pinterest plus Reddit plus links plus Evergreen, which is pretty much the equivalent of saying baseball is runs plus hits plus home runs plus innings pitched minus errors times games. Like it makes no sense. We just kind of accept it because this is the, the sort of simplified stuff that they can push out. And so we are going to pick on BuzzSumo a little bit, not because they're BuzzSumo, but because they happened to publish a report recently that gave me a couple of uh, useful visit visuals. But this is really everybody in the same space, and it's even kind of the standard best practices. Right in the middle, we have that lovely combined buzzword of 10x and skyscraper as far as this content supposedly that we're supposed to all going to be producing. And then getting there is really this mashup of finding the most linked stuff, finding the most shared stuff, and finding the stuff that performs best organically. Now, in reality, what this often tends to elevate is content from sites that already had a ton of links. All of these tools are really biased toward existing really big sites. And to give an example, you can imagine anything the New York Times publishes, it's going to earn links. Anything that goes up on ESPN.com is going to earn links because those are really huge websites. And it's not dissimilar when we talk about it from a social share perspective, right? If Gary Vee goes out with his one point something million followers on every social platform and he publishes an article, it's going to get likes, it's going to get retweets, it's going to get shares, whatever else but it's really difficult to parse. Okay, did this article get shares because it was really amazing or did it get shares because it was shared by Gary Vee who already has this huge network? And the last place this bias kind of creeps in is it really elevates stuff where it's organically targeted. And we know there's tons of really, really good stuff out there that has no keyword target. It's really difficult to be on kind of the bleeding edge of things if you're going after keyword targets because those are things that people already know and are looking for. So we're supposed to believe that this top content kind of resides in the middle of this stuff, but in reality, we know that there are lots of little biases built in. And just to give you an example, you take something like a, a term like content strategy. If I were to go into Ahrefs and pull the top ranked stuff for content strategy, it turns out the average domain authority is 90. So we're left believing either that only like the 1,000 most powerful websites on the planet are the only people who are publishing really cool, interesting, amazing stuff on content strategy, or we have to start to think that, you know what, the way that we traditionally do research and look at these things, they're going to be biased toward those really big websites. And so we have to figure out a way to get around that. We have to understand the limitations of this quantitative data. Because even when we think about, okay, what if we cleaned up this data? What if, um, you know, we had better data? We're still looking at micro conversions, links and shares. We like to think if we follow the stuff that's links, high links, high shares, it's going to work. But none of us are getting this CRM data like 
leads generated or deals closed or revenue like these, these, what could be these incredible things, right? If a tool could deliver these things, it would be awesome, but we're not getting that. So even if we had cleaner data, it's still just those micro conversions, which, you know, anybody that's worked in conversion optimization knows there's kind of this like, eh, do you want to optimize for micro conversions? Maybe, maybe not. Now, even for a second, if we suspended belief and just pretended that we actually had a tool that could give us this stuff, that we actually had a tool that could tell us how many deals were closed from every piece of content, that would help us create stuff that really, really resonated with users. But it's not necessarily going to help us create stuff that's going to differentiate what we're doing. And to give an example of that, imagine on one axis here, we have plotted the potential for differentiation. And on the other, the tool's data quality. The initial assumption would be like, hey, is, as the tool's data quality gets better, if they start getting LinkedIn data, if they start getting like somehow form filled data for stuff, then we're gonna be able to differentiate ourselves. But the reality is that we're all still using these same tools. So as long as all of us keep using the same tools, even as that data quality gets better, it's not gonna help us differentiate. So right now we're here where the data quality is kind of meh, but even if we imagine this hypothetical personal, uh, you know, this hypothetical perfect scenario, it's really not gonna get us any closer to differentiation. And so there's a part of this that's really frustrating, right? It's like, well, great. So all the quantitative data in the world is not going to help me differentiate. And my answer to that is yes. But the great part about that is it means you're not about to be replaced. You are not, a, you are not like one spreadsheet away from not having any impact anymore. It means the people that are really going to crush it are the people who accept that, yeah, quantitative data can be a baseline, but real success is about doing really, really good, creative problem solving work. And that requires that qualitative analysis. So now we're gonna walk through three ways that right now you can start executing on that qualitative analysis. The first thing that we can do, and this is kind of the most traditional route, is to take some of the initial quantitative data that we're used to seeing, improving that data, and then using that better baseline of quantitative data to do a quanti qualitative analysis. So this is like a standard export that you get from Ahrefs. If you go into Content Explorer, this is for the term uh, business expense management. So we were working with a client and they, they business expense management was a relevant term for them. You can imagine this is like either you're on a business trip. How do you, you know, get reimbursed for the Uber? You're taking clients out to dinner, all those kind of situations. That's what we're talking about with business expense, ma expense management. Now, what you'll quickly notice is all the stuff that ranks toward the top Wikipedia, IRS, massive news sites. If I'm trying to answer the question, what kind of content on business expense management is really going to work? This is completely useless for me. I absolutely understand why this stuff earns links and shares, right? We've just walked through all the reasons that Wikipedia and IRS.gov are gonna have a ton of links to their articles, but none of this is useful to me. So the traditional method that we'd be stuck with is basically to scroll through this list of maybe it's like 3000 URLs and to start to hope maybe at some point that we come across something that feels more relevant to us. Now, what we can do to improve on this is really just add a little bit of context. So sometimes one or two extra metrics, just you know, combining a couple of metrics in this little tiny algorithm can make a really big difference in the quality of that baseline quantitative data. So I'm gonna share a couple of ways that I like to do this, but I really encourage you to kind of find your own ways to do it because ultimately what we wanna do here is do something that's a little bit unique. So if you're doing, again, the exact same thing as everybody else, you're not going to get to that point of differentiation. As you think about that, just think about keeping it simple. How can you add one column? two columns to a spreadsheet to give yourself a better data set, a unique data, data set, and really give you a better baseline for doing qualitative research. So the two that I like to pull, the first one uh, involves pulling a few extra link metrics. So if you have Screaming Frog, um, you can use the Ahrefs API or the Moz API, they have several connected in there. And so you already have the number of links to an article, but you can also pull down the number of links to the entire domain, the RDs to TLD, top level domain, and you can pull down the number of referring domains that go to the homepage. Now, the reason for that is with a little bit of math, what we can do is we can take the number of referring domains to the website, the whole entire website, subtract the links to the homepage. And what we end up with is referring domains to pages other than the homepage. And this is just a quick way to clean up that data a little bit, because we know that websites get tons of their links to the homepage, lots of brand mentions, that kind of stuff, those basic links. Once we kind of throw those out, the remaining set of links are the links that are more likely to have come about probably through a lot of content. So it's, it's a rough metric, it's absolutely imperfect, but it gets a little bit better. It's a little bit more useful when you see what we do with it in a second. So you can see there on the far right, for example, now we all have, we have now the list of referring domains that go to pages other than the homepage. So now if you take the number of referring domains to the article divided by the number of non homepage referring domains, and you turn that into a percentage, what you get is the number of non homepage referring domains an article accounts for. And that's a really kind of uh, fancy long winded way of saying we can answer the question, were these results a big deal for this website? Instead of just looking at those absolute number of links that tend to elevate Wikipedia, that tend to elevate IRS, we can start to see, hey, were these results really surprising and impressive for this website? 
And so what you start to see is all of a sudden we can see that, oh, hey, this article actually like 10% of all links to this website that don't go to the homepage, go to this one article. So if that website has 100 articles, I know they can't possibly be all getting that much. So it's a really good way to be able to identify some outliers that are really, really strong performers amid all the other content on that site. And because it's a relative metric, it allows us to compare sites of varying sizes. The second little one I like to pull in here is to be able to answer this question of, hey, are these links driven by rankings or do they really have a wow factor? And if you're doing an export from something like Ahrefs, you already have the data that you need to be able to do this. What you're doing is you're just dividing the number of referring domains to an article by the traffic estimate that, uh, that Ahrefs has. And what you end up with is the number of referring domains per organic visit as a metric. And the reason this metric matters is if you think about uh, going back to the earlier example of content strategy, if you're sitting at the top of search results for content strategy, thousands of visits, inevitably bloggers, freelancers, people just looking for like a quick little citation for an article on content strategy or a metric within there or a quote within there, they're going to go find your result because you rank first for a high volume keyword and you're going to earn links that way. It's a great strategy to earn links to your website if you're sitting there, but what it does is it creates noise in our data because a lot of the stuff that's going to be the most linked stuff is going to be stuff that's kind of okay, but it might just be sitting on a really powerful website and so it ranks for a lot of stuff. And so the, the metric that you get out of this is just referring domains per organic, per organic, organic visit. The higher this number is, the more likely it is that this content earned links without any kind of organic support. So basically this thing shows up nowhere in search results, but it's still earning tons of links, which tells me there's a really good chance that this thing earned links because it was awesome, because it was really, really interesting to people. They went out of their way to cite it. They found it in other channels other than organic. With those two metrics, we go back to our original spreadsheet. So now we have a little bit stronger metrics that we can use to kind of play around with this data. And there's no perfect way to do this. This is absolutely an exploratory thing where, hey, play around with the different ways you can filter and reorganize this data. And I'll show you what we'll do with it. So you take, for example, we start by sorting by referring domains per organic visit. So we're looking at the stuff that earned the most links without having any kind of real visibility in search. You can filter for the absolute number of referring domains. The reason for this is we're looking at a lot of relative metrics, but we don't necessarily want to pay attention to an article that earned three links on a website that has five links. So you can set an absolute baseline of saying like, I only want to look at stuff that earned at least 25 links. That's kind of my absolute baseline of something that took off. And then you can filter the percentage of referring domains to the non to pages other than the homepage. And usually you can play around with this, but I like around 2%, which seems like a really small number, but what it gets rid of is a lot of stuff that's earned links, even though it counts for like 0.001% of the total links to that website. So even with those, those, those few little filters and sortings, you can play around with this, do this three, four different times, different little metrics, like different, different raise and lower the bar, see what you see. And when you look at the top 40 or 50 results, as you go through, when you see stuff that's relevant, just flag it as, as yes, as, as interesting. The, the goal here is that we know that in any kind of content export, we're gonna have a lot of like noisy, just irrelevant articles because it's just based on keywords. So when you see stuff that seems relevant, tag it as yes, then go change your filters, go resort your data, keep doing that until you sort of see all the stuff that you felt like you've, you've seen most of what's out there. And what you end up with now is this is where I stop with quantitative data. What I have is I have everything in here is tagged as yes. So I know this content is relevant. I know it's, it's, it's relevant to what um, I should be thinking about and talking about. And I know that it's met some baseline quantitative metrics of being something that was kind of an outsized performer that didn't just earn links through rankings. But at this point, I don't care about the quantitative data anymore. I am not creating a rank order list now and saying whichever one scored the highest is the one that I pay attention to. What I have is a list of improved quantitative data that is unique to me because I put in these extra metrics. And now I'm going to go through and look at those titles and start to code this data. And by coding the data, all you're going is you're looking through title by title and you're saying, okay, what's the theme here? What's the topic? And once you go through all that, say you go through it for two, three, 400 URLs, depending on however you've scoped this project, what you'll end up with is you'll end up with maybe a half dozen or eight or 10 different themes that you can then use to map onto topics for your site, for your client, whoever it is. The way I like to think about this, start with the biggest themes. Some themes you're gonna think right off the bat, I don't know if this is gonna be right. I don't know what kind of article I would create for my client on this doesn't matter. Just create those catalog, those themes that come up the most. And what you'll tend to find is that for any given theme, there are lots of different avenues you can go. So for the example, for the outcome of this research that we did, one of the themes is where do you draw the line in employee misuse, right? What counts as like you should or you shouldn't expense something. And one of the things that came up that we saw was, for instance, technology made it easier. You didn't have to deal with paper receipts, but there was also this anxiety about you know, getting encroached uh, you know, on your privacy. If you have an app that now manages all your expenses or you know a, a, your own individual company card now all of a sudden like do you really want your company knowing that at the hotel bar you use part of your per diem at like 11 30 to order another bourbon like maybe you don't want that on there and that's an anxiety this was the thing that people were concerned about or another one that this expense management could create a corporate nanny state so in this example um, we work 
a few years ago basically banned people from expensing any meal that contained meat in it. So there's this anxiety that once there are these controls in place, once it's easier because things are automated to kind of limit what you can and can't spend on, you have this moralizing coming top down. So we ultimately came up with is an idea of, hey, here's a topic that we could cover for our client that feels right, is how to communicate changes to expense management. So the buyer is going to be somebody higher up. And there's this issue of, hey, the challenge is that once we buy this, everybody has all these anxieties about what's going to happen. So how can we provide that information to help that transition be smoother, to help them highlight the real benefits and purpose? And one of the great validating things is this, when we presented this to the client and this potential topic, they immediately said, wow, this is like spot on. This is perfect. So it was a great validation of the qualitative research, but there's no way that we would have gotten there with the tra traditional metrics of doing it. At the same time, one of the limits of doing that is we still look at the same quantitative data. We're still dealing with the fact that, hey, this is stuff where something could have earned 80 links and 70 of those were spammy links or, or bought or whatever else. The second option that we have is to really use comments to get to the why. Whereas looking at that quantitative data is still requiring us to do a bit of storytelling. It's still requiring us to engage in a bit of narrative fallacy. Using comments can really help us understand exactly why it is that certain content resonated. And there's no better way to do that than websites that have upvoting systems. So Hacker News is one of my favorite for B2B. Reddit also works. There are plenty of other industry forums. Any of those kind of systems that use those upvotes are phenomenal for this. And that's not just because they surface the popular articles when you dump in a term like unlimited vacation. It's because once you get into these articles, you look at the comments, all the comments are also upvoted too. So instead of just looking at a blog and seeing there are 50 comments on it and trying to guess, hey, which of these comments like did people care about, did they disagree with, did they love, you can actually use the upvoting system within the comments section to actually get a sense of which aspects were really most important. So you get the context of specifically, how are people reacting to this article? What are they saying about it? And in general, for the total audience that was here, which aspects of those comment, that commentary really resonated the most? So we take something like some of these articles on unlimited vacation, we see stuff that comes up like somebody saying, hey, look, why can't you do both? Why can't you have a baseline of, hey, you get paid for X number of days a year if you leave the company, but then there's also no cap on that if you went beyond that. So that's one idea that keeps coming up. What about somebody really challenging here the idea that unlimited means unlimited? Because obviously you can't take 365 days off, but really you also can't take 100. You can't take 50. Maybe you can take 20. So again, it's, it's maybe this word unlimited that really caused a lot of the frustration here because it just seems disingenuous. And then somebody else highlighted this great example that got really popular in the comment section, which was financial companies force people to take two uninterrupted weeks off because that's the only way they can audit their system. So they can see when you're gone, if all of a sudden like numbers go really weird, then they know you've been doing some shady stuff. And of course you can do the same thing on Reddit. Some of the stuff that comes up from this article on Netflix that's really old, but still kind of interesting to see. This was sort of like, this was when it was a really big deal to offer unlimited vacation. It was kind of a novel offering. Somebody immediately comes out and says it's a scam. And they have their two reasons. And this was the most popular comment. One is that from an accounting perspective, this is supposed to be paid time. So all of a sudden when it becomes this, nobody's accounting for time, it's really letting your employer off the hook. It's almost like an accounting trick that they think their employer is using. The other thing is that they say productivity expectations are based on what somebody will be working full time. And so you imagine if you historically have a two weeks off per year policy, and then you go to unlimited, that expectation of like, well, you can take off as much time as long as you get your work done. If historically people have only been able to take two weeks off, that time to get your work done is probably only going to allow you to take those two weeks, not 20, 30, 40 days. So all these fascinating little details that you get from these systems, and it's automated for you. This is a great thing to do if you're really in a time crunch, because you don't have to, you know, that first example was a fair amount of like digging through the quantitative data, exports, refining these, whatever. Here, it's already surfaced for you. All the stuff you want to pay attention to, all the articles, they're already at the top of these boards, and all the comments are already at the top within those sections. The last thing we're going to talk about is heuristic SERP analysis is a third opportunity. We've so far been really focusing on stuff that earns links and shares, but we also know that even within the context of organic search, we want to find out what is that angle that we can bring that's going to make our stuff unique, stand out. My favorite, absolute favorite part about heuristic SERP analysis is that the one common language between SEO experts and people that know nothing about SEO, which are often our bosses, our clients, whoever they may be, is that everybody understands viscerally the experience in the search engine results page. Everybody understands what it's like to see the results, to see who ranks, to see what's in there. So it's a great opportunity if you really need to create something compelling and you don't think a spreadsheet's gonna get it done to really be able to explain in a visual way what's going on. And so the truth is that even though SEO can be really esoteric and hard to understand sometimes, we also know that Google is showing its hand with every search result. They're giving us a literal rank order list of the stuff that they think is most relevant and most important for a given keyword. So there's lots of information that's baked into every search engine results page. So if we take something like Beach Checklist 
And if, for anybody who's noticed, I did go from unlimited vacation to beach checklist. I am taking a vacation next month. My company does offer unlimited vacation, but actually works great for us. If I look through something like beach checklist and just see what comes up in the results, the very first thing that I see that really sticks out to me is, hey, look, there's nothing in this query that specifically says I want some kind of visuals. But the very first thing that Google returns is three rows deep of images. So right away, I'm, I'm thinking Google has a lot of data that suggests that even without an explicit intent in the query, people want a visual. So there's no way I'd even think about creating content on this unless I had some kind of downloadable PDF um, you know, or something that is really, really visual that I could succeed with in image search, right? Because a lot of these clicks are gonna flow straight to images. The other thing that I would think about is if these clicks are flowing straight to images, it means nobody's coming in like browsing on our site, spending time on an article, maybe seeing a CTA, maybe, maybe seeing a pop-up. These people could go straight to these images, print and be done with us. So I would absolutely think about, you better get your brand, you better get something, you know, a call to action, your website, something embedded within this, Im in, within this image. Otherwise you could rank number one, but do nothing for the brand awareness that you're hoping to create. The next thing that I can see here is that this is like a really mature search result. This thing has already been optimized to death. My favorite part about this is there are two people who rank among the top, top five saying that they have the only beach packing list you'll ever need. So there's an absolute need for like a cage match between these two results to figure out which one is actually the only one that people need. But you can also see that somebody at the bottom there's already tagged the 2021 edition, like a very SEO thing to do to make it explicit to search engines that this has been updated. You have the ultimate, which is everybody's favorite, like all in SEO attempt to create something kind of long form. So if I were trying to break into the search result, it's not gonna happen casually. It's not gonna happen by accident. And it's probably not going to happen through some traditional basic SEO optimizations because those things have already been done. And if they're done in the top five search results, there's a good chance it is just as aggressively optimized the top 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, sometimes beyond that, as far as number of results go. The one of the most interesting things that you see here is that uh, you, you're really gonna have to pick a niche. And the reason for that is that when you look at the top results, often our expectation, you know, certainly going back to the beginning of the presentation is thinking that, hey, really big sites are gonna dominate. What you actually see here is that it's a lot of like individual travel bloggers showing up even above who you would think that might be really big in this space, like a, a Travelocity or a Kayak or a Booking.com. These kind of third-party sites that sell vacation stuff that you think would be creating the kind of checklist Google's actually saying, no, we're going we're gonna to value here this kind of experiential expertise, these people who have actually done this kind of stuff, like, right, like kind of hokey or quirky as this kind of stuff tends to be, like these blogs tend to be, they definitely like, it is exactly what you think it is as far as these traditional travel blogs. Um, you know, they are elevating that. So it is interesting. I would not think that if I'm a third party site, I can get in here. I would think I'm going to need to be an expert somewhere, which probably means niching down, which probably means finding a long tail keyword. But it might mean that, hey, if, if you're not where, where are you relevant geographically? It might not be that you can do like a generic beach checklist. You might have to do a, a specific beach checklist for a specific area. Or maybe if you're attracting, you know, your company goes after really knows a specific type of, of buyer persona, a specific type of user that you serve. Maybe you create a checklist that's geared toward that person, but you better be ready to niche down because there, there's not a lot of space otherwise to get into this. If you don't have any of that really experiential expertise that you bring to the table, domain authority alone probably isn't going to be enough. The last thing about this that, that it was an interesting takeaway is that honestly, Google is not asking for that much as, as far as authority and credibility. These are really basic lists. We're not seeing like huge text bombs here. I would not say that the solution here is going to be a 4,000 word article. You can get away with a pretty basic checklist. It's pretty visual, basically the thing that people want to download. But there's also, to me, kind of a lack of credibility. Every single link on this right side is a link to an affiliate list on Amazon. So this is like a pure affiliate play. So this is not Google saying, oh, we found a true authority who's impartial. Very clearly, this is somebody who wants to rank for this to make money from it. So if I'm thinking about, you know, what kind of content could potentially beat them out, I'm not thinking that the solution is going to be, oh, let me do this like deep dive on sunscreen with recommendations and studies cited from FDA and CDC on exactly what you need. I don't see that being the thing that's going to get you to the top because right now I don't see Google caring that much. So what are we, where are we left with now? We've walked through these three different ways. What are the takeaways? First, Quantitative data, it just give up. It's not getting you there. It's never going to get you there. Even if it makes your content better, it's not going to differentiate. So sooner rather than later, you've got to dive into that qualitative research. Second, you can improve your quantitative data. That's going to give you a unique data set. It's going to give you a better data set. And then you're going to have this really nice baseline that you can use to code themes that you can use as this repository and then map those onto the topics that make the most sense for you. Third, you can gather data from social sites. I had two examples. You can do this a million different sites. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it a bunch of different places, but it's really gonna give you that why data instead of asking you to kind of create that narrative based on looking at a page title or taking a quick look at an article. 
And lastly, you can use this SERP analysis to identify angles and opportunities, and especially when you really need to be persuasive to a boss, give something visual that you can walk through and make your case about why you need to craft an article the way that you do. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I have two, two quick questions. Um, first, where are you going on vacation? Uh, middle of nowhere, Florida, just sitting on a beach somewhere. Um, it's total cop out. My folks were going and they were like, do you want to come? And I was like, free beach house? Like, yeah, I'll show up. <laughs> I'll no, be that, there. That sounds perfect, honestly. Um, and then the actual question is, so we've got this framework uh, with the barbell strategy at Omniscient. So we put maybe 80% of our bucket into SEO driven product led keywords, and then maybe 20% into this buzzworthy content bucket. And that's sort of content that's designed to, uh, to build links, to gain social shares and to just generally cause a ruckus. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this, this quantitative um, processing allows you to find pages that uh, sort of punch above their weight and don't necessarily take the domain authority and like the already built in audience of the, the blog to publish them. So I, we, we have a couple of formats in mind when we, when we pick these buzzworthy pieces that are usually going to maybe be easier to build links to, but I'm curious if you found any uh, patterns, I'm sure it depends on the industry, but if, if there's any patterns of like what type of content tends yeah. to like drive more links than others, regardless of like kind of the blog they come from. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a really good way to do research as far as to just dig through and see what are some of the common themes like when you're you don't necessarily have to code themes specifically for the topics but like when you code those themes you're going to have an outcome of like okay here's the stuff that resonated and when you do punch above the weight, you can obviously prioritize stuff that had like a really high percentage of the links for the site you could even filter out like I want to filter out any website that has a domain authority above 70 and just look at stuff that's in like the mid tier to find opportunities. Um, you know, the, the only thing that we get stuck with that gets difficult is there's still so much noise in that data. Like you still never know when something earned 50 links because like they randomly went all in and spent a bunch of money with some outreach agency or it's like spam. So there is that kind of like, you can do that initial qual quantitative list, but then often you still have to dig down and figure out, okay, what really made things successful here, which is, it's a great thing that you can pair sometimes if it's something that it did resonate, it should have showed up, shown up on like Hacker News or Reddit at some point, or even you just go on Twitter, just drop the URL into the search on Twitter, and it's going to show you everyone who shared that, and it's going to give you like their little snippet about why they shared it. So it's going to allow you to kind of like layer in some of that data, that qualitative data of like, oh, hey, this didn't just get shared, it got shared because, and then you have that information from whoever was sharing it or whatever like comments flowed from that. Um, it's a great way to add in some additional uh, information because we just don't learn much from like links and shares. It's like, I, I couldn't tell you half the time why it is that something earned links. Um, yeah, cer certainly there's a randomness factor. I love the Twitter thing. I used to do that with CXL blog posts and we found, you know, like this controversial thought leadership ones tend to be like heavily talked about on Twitter. So I think that was a good way to validate some of those things. Um, anyway, thank you very much. This was an awesome talk. Um, I'm gonna have to go back and take some notes, but this, this sounds like an amazing process uh, for uncovering uh, kind of hidden gems through quantitative and qualitative research. So thank you. Sure, thanks so much for having me.